In this PowerPoint, we'll explore the basics of the quantum mechanical model of the atom in more depth. In particular, we'll talk about the four quantum numbers that describe electrons and their orbitals in the Schrodinger equation. Remember that Schrodinger's equation defines the position and energy of an electron as a wave function. And these wave functions can be thought of as three-dimensional standing wave orbitals for the electrons. And they represent the most probable location of an electron at a given energy level. When Schrodinger's equation is solved for any electron in an atom, it allows us to define a set of quantum numbers that describe that electron orbital or the most probable location of that electron. The first quantum number is known as the principal quantum number, and it's usually given the variable n. It defines the location of the overall energy level of the electron, and it's based on the quantized energy levels of Bohr's model. And like Bohr's model, the values of n are whole number and integers starting at 1. So n equals 1 is closest to the nucleus, n equals 2 is a little bit farther out, and n equals 3 is even further out. And the farther a energy level is away from the nucleus, the higher the potential energy it has. This is because that negatively charged electron is now farther away from the attractive force of that nucleus, the positive charge inside it. So Bohr's energy levels worked for the hydrogen atom, which only had one electron, but it failed to describe the energy differences observed in atoms that contain more than one electron, anything besides hydrogen. So the quantum mechanical model does describe what happens in these multiple electron atoms because it indicates that at each of these energy levels, multiple atomic orbitals exist with unique three-dimensional wave shapes. So the next two quantum numbers describe these three-dimensional wave shapes that can be found at each of these principal energy levels. The shape of the different possible orbitals found at each energy level is defined by the angular quantum number L. L is also a whole number integer, but its possible values are defined by the principal energy level of that electron. So values of L start at zero and at any particular principal energy level can extend to a value of N minus one, where n is the principal quantum number or the principal energy level. So for example, electrons at an energy level of n equals 2 can actually be found in two different shapes of electron orbitals. They can be found in the orbital that's associated with L equals 0 or that associated with L equals 1. And 1 of course is the limit for that particular energy level because n minus 1 equals 1 in this case, because our principal energy level is 2. So 2 minus 1 equals 1. If we go a little bit farther out, we can accommodate one more shape. So at n equals 3, our different orbitals can be associated with the shape with l equals 0, l equals 1, or our limit of 3 minus 1, L equals 2. Now in the opposite direction, if we go closer to the nucleus, at a primary or principal energy level of N equals 1, our limit is, well, 1 minus 1, or 0. So there's only one shape associated with the closest energy level, L can equal 0. To avoid confusion between our principal quantum number and our angular momentum quantum number, we often represent the orbital shape using letters instead of the numbers. So each L value has an associated letter associated with that shape. For L equals zero, it's known as an S orbital. L equals one, is associated with the p orbital, l equals 2 is a d orbital, 
and L equals 3 is an F orbital. So in the known elements today, these are the four different orbital shapes that are found, but theoretically more are possible with higher levels of angular quantum numbers. But these are the ones that we find in our atoms today. So these are the uh, levels or the uh, orbital shapes that we'll be dealing with. So let's take a look at some of these different orbital shapes. And the simplest shape or standing wave pattern is that found at L values of zero. So this is also known as the S orbital. And the shape is simply a three dimensional sphere. And the three S orbitals that are represented here show that sphere found at the first energy level, so n equals 1, the second energy level, n equals 2, and the third energy level, or n equals 3. We also have the alternate designation for that combination of principal quantum number and angular momentum quantum number. The number in front represents that principal quantum number or energy level. And again, it's just an indication of generally the distance out from the nucleus that you can expect uh, that electron to be. And the letter is the representation of the angular momentum quantum number. So S means L equals zero. Now these drawings up at the top are drawn with hard outer edges. And they're known as 90% probability drawings. That hard outer edge simply represents the distance from the nucleus um, within which you have 90% probability of finding an electron. But it's really important to remember that electrons, the actual orbitals, should be thought more of as an electron cloud um, that ultimately represents the most probable location of an electron. We can't define the exact location. So it's the most probable location associated with that electron. You actually have some probability of finding an electron a little bit farther outside that edge represented by these uh, drawings. And also you have probability of finding an electron within uh, that sphere represented by the drawings. So one way of showing this is actually the uh, probability distributions that are represented at the bottom of the screen. So on the y-axis of these graphs, we actually have our probability function. And higher values simply indicate a higher probability of finding an electron at that particular location. On the x-axis, we have the distance from the nucleus in units of picometers. Zero represents the nucleus itself. The purple line is simply that probability function versus distance from the nucleus. We also have here a um, quarter section of that electron cloud representation. Um, so it looks kind of diffuse like a cloud, and it simply represents the most probable locations of finding an electron. And you can see that there is a relationship between the peak distance at which you have the most probable um, chance of finding an electron and kind of the edge of the electron cloud. So it's very close to the edge of that particular electron cloud. So you have the most probability of finding an electron on the edge, represented by the hard outer edge associated with uh, the drawings up at the top. But you still have a certain probability for finding an electron a little bit farther out or a little bit closer to the nucleus. Um, the probability does drop to zero as we get closer and closer to the nucleus, but there is some probability of actually finding that. At higher energy levels, so the 2s and the 3s drawings, we see that the most probable locations are farther out, but again associated with um, ultimately that edge um, that we're seeing in the drawings up above. An interesting pattern actually develops for these uh, higher energy levels where the outer edge is a little bit farther out. You can actually get sort of a wave pattern uh, within that standing wave shape. So um, you'll notice that as we get closer to the nucleus, for example, on this 3s orbital, the probability of finding an electron actually dips to zero at a certain distance in between the nucleus and the outer edge. And then it rises again and then dips back down to zero before we ever reach the nucleus. 
And then it rises again and then dips back down to zero at, at the nucleus itself. So uh, these uh, positions where probability drops to zero within that larger shell shape, these are known as radial nodes. And they're a really common pattern that you see uh, for uh, all of the different orbital shapes associated with higher energy levels. So next, let's look at the shape associated with the p orbital or angular momentum quantum number L equals one. Instead of being a sphere, our standing wave pattern is more of a dumbbell or a three-dimensional figure eight. And this shape pattern has some amount of directionality to it that the sphere did not. So in other words, this figure eight pattern can be found um, in orbitals actually oriented in three different directions. We call them X, Y, and Z. So you can imagine this one is actually horizontal in the plane of the screen. This is vertical in the plane of the screen. And this one is actually pointing out at you and pointing back into the screen. That's the best representation that we can come up with for the Z direction. All three of these orbitals coexist, and different electrons can be found in all three of them at the same time in one energy level in one atom. So this is a picture of the three of them overlapping. Um, the P shape can be found at energy levels of two and higher, and at each of these energy levels, um, all three of them overlap and coexist, and we call them the P subshell or sublevel. To designate which of these three orbitals a particular electron can be found in, we have to introduce a third quantum number. This one will designate orientation of the orbital. So this number is known as the magnetic quantum number. It's abbreviated M sub L and it specifies the orientation of the orbital shape in three-dimensional space. And m sub l values are whole number integers, but they're restricted in value by the shape of the orbital, or the l, or angular momentum quantum number. In particular, the number of m sub l values, or the possible orientations for a shape, are defined by the value of l such that for any specific shape or L value, the whole number integers start at the negative of that L value, increase step by step through the integers to zero, and then keep increasing to the positive of that L value. So it's a little bit easier to understand if we look at some examples. So let's start with the P orbital or uh, L equals one. So at L equals one, our possible M sub L values range from the negative of that L value to the positive of that L value and all of the whole number integers in between. So that means negative one, zero, and plus one. So three possible orientations. Those three possible orientations correspond to our probability drawings for the P subshell at the second energy level, and really at any, any energy level. The 2PX orbital, the one oriented horizontally, is associated with uh, the M sub L value of negative one, that particular orientation. The vertical orientation in the Y direction is associated with M sub L values equal to zero. And the Z direction orientation is associated with M sub L values of plus one. And sometimes you can find this actually represented in our alternate uh, notation for our quantum numbers as a subscript on the letter associated with the shape. So 2P to the negative one, 2P to the zero, and 2P to the plus one. Now let's look at some of the M sub L values for the other shapes. So we'll start with L equals zero first. So this is the S orbital or the sphere shape. And as we know, the sphere only has really one orientation. And it turns out that the M sub L can only have one particular value. If L equals zero, then M sub L can only equal zero.
So one orientation associated with the S or sphere shape. If we increase our L value though to two, which is associated with our D orbital shape, your M sub L values can have five possible values. So this means five possible orientations to the D orbitals. So they can range from negative two, our negative L value, stepwise all the way to plus two. So that's negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, or plus two. And if we go to a higher value of L, we get even more possible orientations. At L equals three, which is associated with our F orbital shape, the orbitals can be found in seven possible orientations with ML values ranging from negative three to plus three. So let's take a look at some of these more complex standing wave patterns. This is a representation of the standing wave patterns associated with the D orbitals or angular momentum quantum number two. So for the most part, these really are more of a clover leaf pattern with four different lobes associated with them. Although the orientation that's associated with M sub L or magnetic quantum number of zero is a pretty uh, different representation of that clover leaf. But all five of these different orientations coexist. So these are each considered a D orbital, but they all overlap and coexist at the same time in an, an atom that actually contains D orbitals with electrons in them, you will find multiple electrons occupying these different orbitals at the same time. So the F orbital patterns are even more complex with more lobes associated with the standing wave. And at an angular momentum quantum number of three, we have seven possible orientations or seven different orbitals associated with the F shape. So this is known as an F subshell because all seven of these coexist and overlap within the atom. So in an atom that actually contains electrons in the F subshell, those electrons will be found spread out amongst all of these different orbitals. So this is another way of representing the orbitals described by these three quantum numbers so that we can see multiple orbitals in an atom at the same time. It's known as an orbital filling diagram. And each orbital here is represented by a dash. Underneath the dashes are the principal energy level and the, and the shape associated with those orbitals. And they're depicted in order of increasing energy from the bottom to the top. So at the bottom, we have the orbitals that are closest to the nucleus with the lowest potential energy, so lower principal quantum numbers. And higher up, we see higher principal quantum numbers and distances further away from the nucleus. So the first energy level represented here, the lowest energy level is quantum number n equals one. And remember that the um, values, the possible values for our angular momentum quantum number, which represents the shape, are limited to n minus one. So at a principal quantum number of one, we can only have one possible angular momentum quantum number, and that's zero. So we have only one orbital at that first energy level. It's a 1s orbital. We increase the principal quantum number. So we go a little further out to n equals 2. And now we can actually have two different angular momentum quantum numbers. We're limited to n minus 1 again. So that gives us a value of l equals 1 for the second principal quantum number but we can also have orbitals associated with lower angular momentum quantum numbers. So we can also have an L equal to zero. So we have two different shapes of orbitals associated with the second energy level, 2s and 2p. Again, for the 2s, we only have one orientation, one m sub L value, so we only have one dash associated with this orbital shape. 
but for 2p orbitals, we can actually have three different possible m sub l values, negative 1, 0, and plus 1. Those three different values or three different orientations are represented by three different dashes. What you'll also notice is that there's a slight variation in energy between the different orbital shapes at one particular energy level. So for example, at this n equals 2 level, the 2s orbital is just a little lower in energy than the orbitals that are associated with the 2p shape. So this is because multiple electrons, when you have an atom that has more than one electrons, those electrons actually start to interact with each other in a way that um, causes slight variations in their energy. So that the s orbitals are always just a little bit lower in energy than the electrons that are associated with the p orbitals. We see this same basic pattern associated with uh, the next principal energy level, n equals 3. Now our maximum L value is 2, so we can actually have orbital shapes associated with 0, 1, and 2. Three different shapes, 3s, 3p, and 3d. Again, 3s has only one m sub L value, one orientation, one dash. The p subshell can have three different m sub L values, three dashes. The D subshell now can have five different possible orientations, five different values for M sub L, and each dash represents one of those orientations, negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. So we have five dashes for the D sublevel. And notice again that we get that variation in energy between the different sublevels. So 3S is just a little bit lower in energy than the 3P, and 3p is just a little bit lower than, in energy than the 3d. They're still at the same approximate energy level, so that's your principal quantum number, that's what that actually defines. But there's just slight variations within that principal energy level. We're only able to represent half of the four uh, principal energy level. There just wasn't enough room on the screen to go out to all of the different possible sublevels. But the fourth principal energy level can actually have four different shapes associated with L equals 0, or 4s, L equals 1, or 4p, and what's not shown here, L equals 2 associated with the 4d shape, and L equals 3 associated with the f shape. So we get the same patterns in terms of the number of dashes representing the number of possible m sub l values. So one dash for 4s, three dashes for 4p, and while it's not represented here, there would be five dashes for the 4d and seven dashes for the 4f for all the different m sub l values associated with the f orbitals. We also um, see at least the start of that variation in energy associated with the different sublevels. So 4s is just a little bit lower in energy than 4p. And while we don't have these represented, if 4d were drawn here, we would see that it was just a little bit higher in energy than the 4p. And the 4f would also be just a little bit higher in energy than the 4d sublevels. There's another interesting variation that we see in terms of those energy levels. At higher energy levels, the differences in energy between each of those levels actually become smaller. So they're actually a little bit um, closer to each other, even though they're farther out from the nucleus. And they actually become um, close enough together in both energy and distance that the lower energy sublevels at one energy level can overlap with the higher energy sublevels of the principal energy level below them. So, for example, um, the 4s sublevel actually overlaps a little bit with the um, 3 sublevels and is a little bit lower in energy than the 3d sublevel. 
So there's one last quantum number for us to consider. The first three numbers describe the most probable orbital for any specific electron. But it turns out that two electrons can occupy each of these orbitals. We need one last quantum num number to identify each electron in each individual orbital. And this is known as the spin quantum number, m sub s. And it turns out that electrons spin like planets on an, on an axis. Because the electrons have a charge, though, the spin produces a magnetic field. And the direction of that field, or the north and south poles associated with it, depend on the direction of the spin. When two electrons coexist in one orbital, they must have their poles oriented in opposite directions. In other words, they must spin in opposite directions. And the spin quantum number simply specifies which direction each electron is spinning. So there are only two values possible for the spin quantum number, plus one half and negative one half. And plus one half indicates that the electron spin is oriented so the magnetic field points up. Negative one half indicates the spin is in the opposite direction so that the magnetic field is pointing down. So you should be able to relate any given energy and sublevel to the appropriate quantum numbers, the number of orbitals present, and the maximum number of electrons that can fill that particular sublevel. And let's like look at a few examples. We'll start with 4F. So just from that designation, we know that the 4 represents our principal quantum number, or n. So n equals 4. The letter is always associated with a specific value of the angular momentum quantum number, or the L. And so F is always associated with L values of 3. And m sub l values are limited by whatever your l value is. So if we have l equals 3, our m sub l values can range um, from negative 3 to plus 3. And so that's actually seven different whole number integers within that range. So each of those m sub l values represents a different orbital. So that's seven different orbitals, or seven dashes if we were looking at an orbital filling diagram. Each of those orbitals can hold a maximum of two electrons spinning in opposite directions. So two electrons in each of those seven orbitals gives you 14 electrons maximum. So you can fit a maximum of 14 electrons in the 4F sublevel. Now let's go in the opposite direction. We'll start with our principal quantum number of n and an L value of 1. It turns out that L values of 1 are always associated with P sublevels. So it's 4P for our principal quantum number and our L value. Our M sub L values, again, are going to be based upon the value of L. So we go from negative 1 to plus 1. And that turns out to be three different possible M sub L values. So three different possible orbitals. If each of those orbitals holds the maximum of two electrons, we have six electrons possible in the 4p sublevel. Now we could do the same thing if we know the principal quantum number and just the number of orbitals. Because we know that the number of orbitals ultimately is specified by the m sub l value and the l value. So if we have one orbital, we have one m sub l value, which is zero, which represents our l value which is also zero. And L equals zero is always associated with the S sublevel. So we're dealing with a seven S for our sublevel. And finally, if we know we have one orbital at that sublevel and it contains two electrons, that's our maximum number of electrons. Let's deal with the one other common orbital shape, and that's the D sublevel. So 5D indicates an N value of 5 and an L value of 2 associated with that D shape. M sub L is then limited to values between negative 2 and plus 2. So that's five different whole number integers within that range. And that represents five different orbitals.
and it, if each of those hold our maximum of two electrons, we have 10 maximum electrons in the D sublevel. So in summary, the Schrodinger equation gives quantum numbers that describe the most probable location for any electron within an atom. These quantum numbers ultimately describe our electron orbitals and the direction of spin of the electrons within those orbitals. So the principal quantum number, n, has whole number integer values starting at 1, and it shows the general location or energy of that orbital, the distance from the nucleus. The angular momentum quantum number, represented by L, can be integers ranging from 0 to n minus 1, where n equals the value of the principal quantum number, and it indicates the shape of the orbital or subshell at that particular energy level. Magnetic quantum numbers, m sub L, give us the orientations of those different orbital shapes, and there are integers that range in value from negative L to positive L. The number of integers, whole number integers within this range, give us the number of orbitals associated with that particular subshell or shape of orbital. And finally, the spin quantum number, which is m sub s, shows the direction of electron spin within each orbital. Each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, and those two electrons must spin in opposite directions. That direction is represented by either a plus one-half or a negative one-half for the m sub s value.